What you see here, with an impressive wingspan of over 9 feet, is a California condor. Many centuries ago, these majestic birds inhabited all of what we now know as the United States of America. But in 1987, the last free-flying California condor was captured. This was a last resort effort by the state and conservationists towards preserving the population. All remaining condors at the time were moved to breeding facilities in California, in the Los Angeles and San Diego zoos. Now, however, 334 condors once again fly free across the state of California and beyond. But what brought condor to that critical stage in 1987? Why did we choose to save them? And what did scientists, researchers, and conservationists do to help bring back this bird? In a time before white settlers reached what to them was the new world, it was already an ancient one to thousands of animals and peoples already living there. At this time, the California condor wasn't just the California condor. Fossils of this bird dating back to over 12,000 years ago have been found all the way up into British Columbia, into parts of Mexico, and what's now New York. The condor was capable of surviving and acclimating to many different biomes, from deserts to forests to plains and mountains. The condor played a crucial role in all of them as scavengers, or in other words, the environment's cleanup crew. But when the rise of human populations and their expansion, the condor's ability to survive in many areas was greatly diminished. About the 1850s, their range had shrunk kind of the same north to south, but just getting into the Rockies, but not any farther east from there. And by the 1950s, their range had shrunk to just this kind of like wishbone shape around the Central Valley in California. And that last shrinkage particularly probably had quite a bit to do with the California Gold Rush and all the influences there. As a consequence of shrinking habitable environments and a reduction of food, condors were forced to scavenge poison carrion intentionally left behind by farmers or toxic remains discarded from hunters. It's an obligate scavenger, so it, it does not kill. It, it only cleans up and eats carrion, dead things. And so what that does is speed up that process of, of removing dead animals from the landscape, which kind of you know, it adds to really reducing the, the possibility of disease spreading. That's what their role is in the environment, as part of the cleanup crew. That's evolutionarily what, what the role is. Without scavengers in the environment, nutrients from decaying carrion have trouble spreading through the ecosystem, while other species not as greatly equipped to process bacteria would be afflicted by diseases from carrion that would have been broken down by these scavengers. Without them, irreparable damage would be inflicted upon the ecosystem. The absence of this bird from our skies was and is not only felt by the environment, but also by many indigenous tribes. Condor, or Pergonish, as it's known to the Yark people, has always been important to indigenous populations across North America. Pergonish is a critical part of the Yurok jump dance, which is a world renewal ceremony practiced by the Yurok people. Well, it was, it was like uh, it was the missing link because we have condor feathers from the past that we use in the jump dance. So they're in their back, so uh, they would be dropping feathers and we'll be using them. They belong here. You see the, the, the beach here, over there, the beach here, how the ocean hits, hits the beach. It, it has big banks like this on it. And my grandmother said that for college would just stand there like that when the wind blew and just wiggle the tips of his, his wings just like that and the wind would blow and pick them right up and they'd just take right off. They didn't even have to flap their wings. The absence of the condor was heartfelt for the Yurok people. Condors are an important part of their beliefs and practices. Feathers dropped by condor are used to make willowies, which are worn in dances. Here's a condor feather right there. Is that? That's huge. And that goes in the back right here. They got what they call a willowie. They tie it up and then they stick it in there. and. Uh, we have the, the line of woodpecker heads come right up through there. Then on the end, they've got uh, porcupine quills uh, braided together up here. It has two, two right there. In Yurok stories, all the creatures, plants, and people played a role in making the world we know. The Yurok see themselves as stewards who have a responsibility to maintain the balance in the world. So it was their duty to call out to protect Condor when it was threatened and by the 1980s, Condor was critically endangered. Europeans who migrated to America brought the greatest contributor to the decline of the Condor population, lead. Lead poisoning is still the number one threat and usually reaches Condors through lead fragments from bullets used in hunting. It is a sad but simple equation. Condors ingest carrion, and with it, the lead fragments from bullets, and they die. Lead is toxic. We all vertebrate species. It 
toxic to multiple physiological systems, your neurological system, to your immune system, to your reproductive system, to your blood system, and that we've known about the toxicity of lead for a very long time. Lead is always toxic to condors and accounts for over half of the deaths of the condors in the wild. This is because lead fragments are commonly found in gut piles and carcasses left behind across the environment. And according to Mike Clark, every fee-flying condor has some degree of lead poisoning, even if it is not enough to cause them to be unable to operate entirely. By 1979, as a result of habitat loss, lack of food, and above all else, exposure to lead, there were only 25 to 35 birds left in the wild and one in captivity. Condor was on the brink of extinction. The threat of losing this keystone species inspired efforts across the board to protect and save this bird. Because of these pressures, organizations like the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Los Angeles Zoo, the Peregrine Fund, and the San Diego Wildlife Animal Park worked with conservationists like Sanford Wilbur and Arthur Rizzer, alongside tribes like the Yurok Tribe, to start the first endangered species recovery program in the United States to bring back the condor. Well, yeah, I mean, it's been, I mean, the frontier is kind of synonymous with adventure, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, the California Condor Recovery Program is the first endangered species recovery program in the United States. All of the following endangered species uh, recovery programs are sort of modeled after the condor uh, program. The condor recovery program started a revolution in conservation as the first endangered species recovery program. The model has been used multiple times to protect species like the black-footed ferret, Mexican gray wolves, and a bald eagle. But being the first species recovery program, came with many challenges that these hardworking conservationists had to overcome. And the program has changed dramatically from introducing mentor birds, releasing condors at age 18 of months instead of six, and introducing elements of human civilization like power lines inside of their cages to teach them to stay away. We were making it up as we were going along because everything that was done mostly um, had, been, had never been done before. Uh, we learned over the years what worked a little bit better, um, incubation temperature, humidity, weight loss and uh, lots of things we can do to, to help chicks that are having problems hatching. Um, that's probably where my crew kind of stands out a little bit. This project was groundbreaking. No one had ever artificially incubated a California condor before, which meant that the group of devoted people had to design the entire program with little to base it off of. It took a long time to perfect the process and it required working with a great variety of experts. Regardless of the lack of prior research and knowledge, a frontier was crossed in 1988 when the first California condor chick hatched in captivity. This chick was given the name Sisquak. Later, in 1992, two of the captive-bred California condors were released in Ventura County, California, only five years after the birds went extinct in the wild. And for the first time in over a hundred years, a breeding pair in Big Sur, California was discovered nesting in the wild in a hollowed-out redwood along the coast. And in 2008, the Yurok tribe initiated the condor reintroduction program, and later, in 2022, they released the first condors to fly over Yurok skies in over a century. The breeding program continues to free condors from release sites in Pinnacles, Big Sur, Humboldt, Boise, and Baja. The future is looking brighter for the condor. The population, which is currently around 330, has nearly doubled since 2017, when there were only 170 condors left in the wild. With non-lead ammunition becoming more accessible, the less condors will die of lead poisoning. The breeding facilities are only getting better at raising condors and releasing them. Humboldt's condor breeding facility plans to release four and six birds each year for the next 20 years. After that, they hope the population will be stable enough to maintain itself without further human intervention. As Tiana Williams put it in an interview with the North Coast Journal, I have a four-year-old daughter. She's going to grow up with condors in her sky for the rest of her life. She's not going to know what it's like to miss condors. She'll always live in a relationship with condors, which is really what this project is all about. Bringing condors home, back into our communities, back into our conversations, and back into our households and into the minds and hearts of our children on the behalf of the hearts of our elders.